Good evening. On behalf of UNC Asheville's Office of Cultural Events and Special Academic Programs, I'd like to welcome you to our keynote address tonight. We are fortunate enough to be celebrating Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Week. Uh, we started last night remembering the past with the Parchment Hour, songs and stories of the Freedom Riders. And tonight we are so pleased and proud to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Boyd. Before we get started, I just wanted to um, give a, a few thanks um, without, of, of folks without whom this would not be possible. Um, Biltmore Farms Hotels is our cultural event series sponsor, and we're so grateful to them because they provide hotel accommodations for all of our artists that come as part of our series. We're very grateful to them. The Office of Cultural Events, along with Multicultural Student Programs here at UNC Asheville and the Center for Diversity Education also make possible, um, along with the many students, faculty, and staff that help select events, make events like tonight's possible. I also, in case you didn't notice, just wanted to point out that um, we have many fine local organizations with tables out in the lobby this evening. We have Christians for a United Community, Asheville Buncombe Community Relations Council, Building Bridges of Asheville, and YWCA out in the lobby. So please take a moment when you leave to visit their, their tables and find out, if you don't know already, the great work that they're doing right here in our own community. Ask that you please take a moment to turn your cell phones off if you've not done so already. And also wanted to ask that as you leave, there are some little pink slips out in the lobby where we're asking for your input on what you would like to see here at UNC Asheville, um, not only for next year's Martin Luther King Week celebration, but also future years to come. It's really important to us to know um, what you all would like to see and what you feel is valuable um, for us to bring to the community to create further education and dialogue and really create a difference here at UNC Asheville and in our community, our state, and our world. Before we turn it over to our keynote speaker, I would like to thank and introduce Mr. Lamar Hilton, director of UNC Asheville's Multicultural Student Programs. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Good evening everyone. Good evening. Wonderful. I want to make sure that you are awake because uh, we have a very dynamic and excellent speaker here for you all tonight. And I, she is just absolutely amazing. I can't speak well enough about her. She's just really, really awesome. And I can't wait for her to share um, her gift with you all. Um, so I will not be before you long because I would like to get to the reason why we're here. Um, but welcome, welcome, welcome on behalf of the 2013 Dr. Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Celebration Week Committee here at UNC Asheville. I bring you greetings. Um, we are so delighted to have you with us this evening for this special occasion. Um, and we hope that you sit back and enjoy um, what you are about to experience. Um, so before I introduce our dynamic keynote, we have some other dynamic folks in the audience tonight. Um, in the month of November and December, um, we conducted, our university conducted an oratorical competition for um, middle and high school students in the Asheville City and Buncombe County school systems. Um, and I had the distinct pleasure of um, hearing over 15 speeches from students um, at Asheville Middle School, and we were able to select two um, two winners. It was a very, very, very hard selection because all of them were so great. Um, it was like, okay, who do you pick? I mean, it's the best of, of all worlds here. So um, I would like to first recognize um, the avid students from Asheville Middle School who part, uh, participated in this oratorical competition. They're sitting here to my left. So if anybody that is affiliated with avid, whether you are a student, a parent, an administrator, a school teacher, if you could stand and if we can give them a rousing round of applause, please.
Thank you so much for your participation. I see uh, Ms. Cynthia Selinger here in the audience. She is the principal at Asheville Middle School. Thank you so much for allowing us to partner with your school um, on this initiative. We're so um, glad that we were able to see such fine students, and that's really um, encouraging and inspiring to me personally, so thank you. Um, and so tonight, we, I get to share my, what I've seen as a gift with you all. We will hear from our two student speakers that were selected um, for, as winners for the oratorical competition. Our first student is Ms. Ananda Staley, and she is a seventh grade student at Asheville Middle School. And Ananda will, um, she came in second, and she will win a $100 prize and a certificate. And then we will, after Ananda comes and gives her speech, we will hear from our first place winner, Mr. Nian Avery, um, who is an eighth grade student at Asheville Middle School, and he will win a $200 scholarship and a certificate as well. So Ananda and then Nian, in that order. Dr. Martin Luther King had changed my How Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King changed my life was desegregating the United States. If he didn't desegregate the United States, I wouldn't be in Nashville Middle School. I'd probably be in a school that people decided, oh, let's put the black kids here and let's put the white kids here. And I wouldn't meet the friends that I have today. And now, since it's desegregated, I can go on a bus without having to go to the back of it. I can just sit anywhere I want on the bus, not being told what to do or go to jail for it. And no one can judge me there because I could just walk up to another person who's a different color and be like, hi, how's your morning? Without being insulted or judged and now that that has happened, other people that it, when, when other people have children, they wouldn't have to deal with what other people in the 1920s had to deal with, including the boycotts, the um, buses, but then they can look back on the past and wonder about how they got through all of that because it was kind of hard. So being the future people will have a better look at what they're going to in life. Uh, and So, with that being said, some people relive the events of the past, like the march on Washington, and they might recite the words to Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, or they might get everyone to sign a paper that you shouldn't be racist because it's bad, and racism is bad because you shouldn't judge people by the color of their skin, because that kind of doesn't tell you all about, if you judge them by the skin, that doesn't mean they're bad. And if you do, then if they're bad, would you know that? You just judge what color they are. Instead, you could just walk up to them and just try and start a conversation without jumping to conclusions. And with that being said, it wasn't yesterday. 
wasn't the day before yesterday. It wasn't last night that I had a dream. Hello. Hello. I'm sorry. Um, I have a rule. When I speak, I need the crowd to be hype. So, hello. hello. All right, that's more like it. I'm sorry. All right. My name is Neil Watson Avery II. Before I start, I'd like to say a couple of things about myself. I go to Ashford Middle School. I'm currently in the eighth grade, and I'm a young revolutionary poet. Who is, who is inspired by those of wrongful doing and greatness like Malcolm X, and those of selfless bravery like Dr. Martin Luther King. I'm inspired by Dr. King because he stood for what he believed in, even when he was told it wasn't right. Have you ever thought about where you see Dr. King today? There are the obvious places like the marches and the breakfasts, but look at the city buses. Back then, blacks had to sit in the back. Blacks were even passed up by buses, sometimes, and now if you look at 2013, that just changed. We can sit in the front, the back, the middle, and now we even have jobs driving the bus. And look at the marches. Back then, blacks used to march for freedom. And now if you look into a crowd, you will see all different races. I think Dr. King would be proud of that. I believe that was his vision. I can do anything that I want to do. Dr. King proved that. He, along with many other greats, led the way for black men and women with a dream. He proved that if I work hard, I could go anywhere, like Harvard, Morehouse, or UNC Chapel Hill. I'm sorry, I'm not a Duke fan. <laughs> I'm also really inspired at how he stood for what he believed in after he had been kicked, punched, bruised, threatened, stabbed, had his family in danger, and had his house bombed. If Dr. King were here in this room, I'd say thank you. Thank you for freedom, justice, and courage. Thank you for me not being scared walking home from school with fear of being lynched. Thank you for me going over my best friend's house who just happens to be white. In the words of Dr. King, fly. If you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, crawl. Just do whatever you can to keep moving forward. And I think we, as a nation, are doing that. And so, in saying that, thanks, Dr. King. The title of my speech is Martin Had a Dream. And thanks to you, Dr. King, Nian has a dream. Thank you. Thank you to both Nian and Ananda for your wonderful words of wisdom on this evening. We'll now be favored with a selection by Mr. Jalen Blair, who is also an eighth grade student at Asheville Middle School.
Let's give all of our students another round of applause. Thank you so much, students. That was great. And now, the moment we've all been waiting for. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing to you all our keynote speaker for the evening, Dr. Gwendolyn Boyd. Dr. Boyd is a native of Montgomery, Alabama. She was educated in the public schools there and received a four-year scholarship to attend Alabama State University, where she graduated summa cum laude with a BS degree in mathematics with a double minor in physics and music. Boyd was awarded a fellowship to pursue graduate work at Yale University, where she was the first African-American to earn a Master of Science degree in mechanical engineering from this Ivy League institution. In 2005, she was awarded an honorary doctorate of humane letters from Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. And that same year was also awarded an honorary doctorate of humane letters from Bennett College for Women. In December 2009, President Barack Obama nominated her to serve as a member on the Board of Trustees of the Barry Goldwater Scholarship and Excellence in Education Foundation, and she received Senate confirmation in March of 2010. Dr. Boyd is an engineer and the executive assistant to the chief of staff at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory in Baltimore, Maryland. In addition to her current responsibilities at the APL as executive assistant to the chief of staff, she is also responsible for coordination and development of HBCU initiatives, which includes the implementation of the APL Technology Leaders Summer in Internship Program, identifying students as Atlas scholars from HBCUs um, with 3.5 GPAs or higher who aspire to careers in engineering or computer science. From 2000 to 2004, Dr. Boyd served as the 22nd National President of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, an international service sorority with over 200,000 members and over 950 chapters throughout the world. A few of her accomplishments during her tenure as the technology president, as she's 
so uh, term to be in the sorority include establishing technology in all facets of the sorority activities and administration. She received a $1.6 million grant from the National Science Foundation to establish Project C, Science and Everyday Experiences, to promote math and science for middle school African-American girls, moved through the process and was, and was responsible for the sorority achieving non-governmental organization or NGO status at the United Nations, with the Economic and Social Council making Delta Sigma Theta the second African-American organization to obtain this designation. She built a group home for AIDS orphans in Swaziland called the Delta House and provided funding for orphans living in the home. She instituted the sorority's International Day of Service where all chapters throughout the world conduct a service initiative on the same day on the same issue and topic and advocated for education and awareness about HIV and AIDS in Africa and in the U.S. as a part of the first International Day of Service. She currently serves as the sorority's National Social Action Co-Chair. Very active in giving back and helping promote an agenda for the positive growth and development of our youth, Dr. Boyd uses her many talents and skills in service to the community. She freely shares her time with youth to encourage them to seek success. She also serves as a role model for young people interested in careers in math, science, and engineering. Dr. Boyd is a highly sought and widely acclaimed public speaker and addresses audiences ranging from 10 to 10,000 on a variety of topics ranging from inspiration, engineering, science, and technology, nonprofit board and leadership development, African American history, and women's history. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I present to you Dr. Gwendolyn Boyd. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Good evening to all who are gathered here this evening. And I want to begin by saying that our future is in good hands. I want to give another round of applause to these three brave young people who came up here tonight and gave us their very best. And if we continue to celebrate them, then we have no idea where they will go in the future. Uh, I want to thank uh, Lamar for inviting me to come and thank you for that very kind and, and generous introduction that was from Baltimore and I appreciate that. That's our connection. Uh, but certainly I'm, I'm delighted to be here to the leadership of this uh, great campus of the University of North Carolina here at Asheville and all who represent the leadership this evening. We honor you. Uh, to my Soros and Delta Sigma Theta, I thank you for coming out this evening. And to all others who are a part of the National Panhellenic Council, uh, uh, other black Greek letter organizations, we honor you for whatever colors you may wear and the service that you give. And to all who are a part of this great campus and the extension of this great campus in this community, I thank you for being here tonight as we honor Dr. Martin Luther King in this celebration and all the activities that have taken place this week. For the Greeks boast of Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Homer, and Demosthenes. The Romans honor their emperors, Caesar and Constantine, and the English take pride in the works of Shakespeare, Jemison, Kipling, Tennyson, Churchill, and Chaucer, and the legacy of their kings and queens. The French idolize Napoleon and Joan of Arc, Charles de Gaulle, and Charlemagne. But tonight, I lift my voice for one who is unequaled in his legacy of leadership, one who is unsurpassed in his service, one who confidently and valiantly shaped the destiny of African Americans in this country and people of color throughout the world. Tonight, I lift my voice for one who was undeniably the most influential and inspirational person of the 20th century, one who possessed the intellectual capacity to pull together authoritative words and the magnificent voice to carry them lilting through the air with resounding profundity to audiences and congregations around the globe. Tonight, 
I lift my voice, acknowledging one who possessed incomparable courage and valor and unparalleled powers of persuasion under the banner of peace and nonviolence. One who was intentional, inclusive, purposeful, influential, and impressive. Tonight, I lift my voice for one who possessed a unique air of sophistication and charm, and one who was intellectually com comfortable in the presence of kings and queens and princes and presidents and prime ministers, and yet still compassionate enough to reach out and comprehend and care about the plight of the common man. We come tonight to celebrate one who blazed the path and led the way and encouraged all of us to follow, one who knew what had to be done in his generation, and he just did it, not waiting for anybody to give him permission, authorization, sanctions, or endorsements. He just did what had to be done. And tonight we gather to celebrate his life his legacy, the dreamer and his dream. And from this celebration, we will also be able to devise a strategy of how we shall now take what we have learned about him and build a dream of a new le leadership and prosperity. We've come tonight to honor one man, one American, one African-American man who dared to be different and who dared make a difference. We note with interest tonight one of his famous sermons where he said, if any of you are around when I have to meet my day, I don't want a long funeral. And if you get somebody to deliver the eulogy, tell them not to talk too long. I'd like somebody to mention that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others. I'd like somebody to mention that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. I want you to be able to say that day that I did try to feed the hungry. And I want you to be able to say that day that I did try in my life to clothe those who were naked. I want you to say on that day that I did try in my life to visit those who were in prison. I want you to say that I tried to love and serve humanity. I just want to leave a committed life. And that's all I want you to say. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or a song, if I can show somebody he's traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain. Because at a time such as this, it is appropriate for us to remind ourselves that he was called a drum major. He was a leader among leaders. He lived for righteousness. He stood for truth. He fought for justice, and he died for freedom. He left a legacy of courage and strength and determination. He was a man of purpose and power and vision and valor and action and reason. And it is a commemoration such as this where we are reminded that he was one who stood steady and steadfast through it all, no matter how long the journey or how difficult the task, no matter how cold the chill, how fierce his enemies, or how few his friends. Dr. King showed us that one person really can make a difference. If we just stop whining, stop looking for excuses, stop making excuses, and stop blaming others we can individually and collectively continue to make a difference today. In his day, Dr. King could be found waiting and watching and seeking and struggling for a so-called better day. He was also the one whose life formed the example for our lives, whose actions we would want to be our own, whose words we would want our mouths to speak. He was also one that helped us understand a worthwhile saying that goes something like this, the one who knows and knows that he knows is wise, follow him. The one who knows and knows not that he knows is asleep, wake him. The one who knows not and knows not that he knows not is a fool, shun him. But the one who knows not and knows that he knows not is a child. 
teach him. And that's why it is important for us to look for the fulfillment of the dream in young people as we have seen tonight and many others who are a part of this community. And we know that one of the prerequisites for moving forward is understanding our history and our past, looking at his life and gleaning from it those pieces of information and inspiration, understanding where we've come from so that we can, so that we can use it as a guidepost for the future. And in that vein, we pick up the telescope of time and gaze down the archives of history. And if we did that, we would see where we have come from as a people in our fight and our pursuit for freedom and justice. Because even as we celebrate Dr. King tonight, we celebrate our movement as a people from Madam C.J. Walker, who was the first millionaire, to Oprah Winfrey, who has so much money, she'll never be able to spend it all. We celebrate our movement from Marian Anderson, who was the first to sing My Country, Tis of Thee on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, to Aretha Franklin, who sang that same song on the steps of the Capitol. We've moved as a people from Carter G. Woodson to Henry Louis Gates, from Sojourner Truth to Susan Taylor, from George Washington Carver to Shirley Ann Jackson. We've moved from Fannie Lou Hamer to Maxine Waters, from Langston Hughes to Will I Am, from Dr. Charles Drew to Dr. Ben Carson, from Rosa Parks to Alexis Herman, from Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune to Dr. Dorothy Irene Height. We've moved from Harriet Tubman to Elaine Jones, from Frederick Douglass to Jeff Johnson, from A. Philip Randolph to Al Sharpton, from Bessie Coleman to Joan Higginbotham, from General Benjamin O. Davis to General Colin Powell. We've moved from Nat King Cole to Brian McKnight, from Count Basie to Common, from Oscar Michaud to Spike Lee, from Cab Calloway to Usher, from W.B. Du Bois to Michael Eric Dyson. We've moved as a people from Dorothy Dandridge to Taraji Henson, from Leon Pike Price to Jesse Norman, from Pearl Bailey to Mary J. Blige, from Bessie Ramey to Beyonce, from Mahalia Jackson to Shirley Caesar, from Lena Horne to Layla Hathaway, from Jackie Robinson to Tony Dungy, from Hattie McDaniels to Monique, from Sidney Poitier to Denzel Washington, from Althea Gibson to Venus and Serena Williams, from Nat Cole to Roland Martin, from Benjamin Hooks to Benjamin Jealous, from Thurgood Marshall to Eric Holder, and from the first African American to run for President Shirley Chisholm to the election of the first African-American president, Barack Hussein Obama. We've come a long way. And what an exciting moment for us to be alive, to participate and witness the process of change, to be a part of the 21st century season of change and forward movement. And Dr. King reminded us in his words that every man must decide whether he will walk in the light of creative altruism or in the darkness of destructive selfishness. And so wherever we are, we have to know that we have to have a vision and allow our lights to shine. And today, more than ever, we need more African-American men and women who will rise up and take action, who will accept the banner of courage and wear the mantle of our ancestors with pride, African-American families who will continue to move forward. We need men and women of courage and conviction who will free themselves from the bonds of selfishness and be willing to help somebody along the way. Dr. King said to the president and members of the Congress, give us the ballot and we will no longer have to worry the federal government about our basic rights. Give us the ballot and we will no longer plead to the federal government for passage of an anti-lynching law. Give us the ballot and we will transform our legislative halls with men of goodwill. And we realize in our history there were many who had to step back so that others could move forward. When we remember four little girls who were killed in Sunday school in Birmingham, Alabama. We remember Bloody Sunday in Selma, Alabama. There were many who had to step back 
and who were kept down and marginalized and ostracized, many who sacrificed their very lives like Dr. King so that we might enjoy the rights and privileges we share today. There are those of us who are still found edging up to the back door of fulfillment, tiptoeing into happiness, occupying a very narrow space according to some who would quant want to quantify us and analyze us and isolate us and categorize us and ignore us and walk over us, compartmentalize us and even exclude us and define us by groups and sections, but we are always found to be those who are tactful and tough at the same time. And we do a delicate balancing act every day. And our legacy reminds us that we are a strong people. We are bold people. We are praiseworthy and brave people. And if you press us down, we will rise. If you push us down, we just speak louder. If you deny us, we pull out our survival kits. If you criticize us, we become invincible. And if you try to bury us, we will live forever. It's time for us to rise up and take action. Because Dr. King also reminded us that freedom is never voluntary given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. And so in the daily existence of our lives, we find that we struggle with a society and a consciousness that would keep us down and steal our strength, shortchange our children, and describe our accomplishments as mediocre at best. We battle daily to keep our dignity and maintain our integrity and defend our children. We're facing an enemy that wants to destroy our self-esteem and our self-respect and obliterate our history. And if we're honest with ourselves, too many of us have lost our will to stand because we've lost our voices as we face our enemies every day. Because the fact is, we still don't live in that colorblind society that Dr. King talked about. Because a colorblind society would not have more segregation in schools today than ever before in our history. A colorblind society wouldn't foster a prison industrial complex and incarcerate disproportionately more people of color and more men of color at a rate per thousand, more than a per thousand in this world. A colorblind society would have 50% women as senators and roughly 28% senators as people of color. A colorblind society with the mightiest military in human history wouldn't stand by as two million people are herded into execution in Darfur and in other parts of Africa. A colorblind society would understand that unalienable rights were not limited in our Constitution only for those with the right documents. A colorblind society would not allow admission to public colleges to be determined by tests which have different results by race. So tonight, my friends, I come to remind us that this is no time for business as usual. This is a time for unusual people with unusual commitments to solve unusually difficult problems. Dr. King said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. And so when we look around today, we've allowed the apostles of fear and hatred to take the reins of leadership. And we've failed to challenge that leadership in too many cases. Because how can you say we want our schools to be safe and you think that the answer to their safety is putting more guns in schools. We have stood mute and allowed them to attack and in some areas discredit the leaders that have been groomed and trusted by our community. And our silence, my friends, in this regard, is as devastating as the silence of martyrs who gave in the past approval to the activities of those who uh, opposed them. And it's tacit approval to the activities of what I call the new Ku Klux Klan. 
I submit that at the basis of all of our aspiration lies one major goal, and that goal is change. We must change the present if we are to have any hope for our future and the future of the young people we heard tonight. And it must become our responsibility to assist the full coming of this change with a minimum amount of confusion and conflict. We have to refuel the vision. We have to reignite the dream, retool our resources, and reinvigorate our passion for freedom and justice. Yes, in this 21st century environment, you can friend me on Facebook, you can follow me on Twitter, link up with me on LinkedIn, you can post pictures on Instagram, text me, email me, do all of those things. But too many of us have fallen silent and our silence has caused our girls to have an identity crisis. Our silence has caused our children to be confused about who they are and whose they are. Our silence has caused our sons and daughters to be misdirected. Our communities are in chaos and our detractors have gained new boldness because racists can't be ashamed of what they say anymore, and bigots aren't embarrassed about what they do anymore. Lawmakers who do not care about laws that they pass that are unjust and unfair and, un and biased. And so it means for all of us that it's time for us to rise up and fight back. We must be bold and brave and vigilant in this day and time to make sure there is a good generation for those who are coming behind us. Because the question is, where are the voices when we see too many of our children without values, homes without disciplines, communities without a conscience, and too many people without hope? Where are the voices when you turn on television not to watch the news, but to watch somebody's opinion of what they think the news should be? Where are the voices when exploitation and sensationalism and lies determine the spin on the story instead of telling what the truth is? Where are the voices when we see starving children, not just in third world countries, but right here under our feet? Where are the voices when too many of our schools have become war zones? Sandy Hook, Columbine, Virginia, Houston, too many schools have become the face of the lack of public safety. And our children should get a standing ovation just for making it to the schoolhouse and back home safe every day. We are failing to act and speak up for our children and for the generations that are yet to come. When we look in our communities, the incidents of domestic violence are on the rise. New cases of HIV and AIDS are affecting more African-American women than ever before. When we see there's a cradle-to-grave pipeline for our young people based on third-grade test scores, they build new prisons to put them in by the time they turn 18. We see voter suppression laws trying to stop citizens from exercising their right to vote. Where are the voices? in this generation to make sure that we don't allow these things to happen. Dr. King said to us, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. So we can no longer be silent. We must rise up and take action. In 2013, we need solutions. We need answers. We need to rise and take action because we know it will make the difference in the future that we are allowed to live in. Yes, in some areas it may be dark now, but it's been dark before. And some of the things that we've gone through have been painful and unpleasant, but they are only there to make us strong, because that's what the Word reminds us. The trials only come to make us strong. And as a people, we've been and still are more than casually familiar with the fact that there is a connection between our struggle and our reward. So it's time for us to make sure that as we're moving forward, we reach back to bring somebody else along with us. Help somebody, as Dr. King said. Everybody can be great because everybody can serve. Every American can make a difference. 
And we have to make sure that we do our part in our community to make a difference. Those of us who have achieved any measure of success got here standing on the shoulders of somebody else. Some aunt, some uncle, some grandmother, some godmother, church neighbor lady, some teacher that helped us make it along the way. And now is not the time for us to become amnesia victims and think that we got here all by ourselves or to be so naive to think that the world is perfect and we don't have anything else to do. All of the efforts and energy would be in vain if we do not continue Dr. G Dr. King's legacy of leadership and service. Yes, there is a wonderful monument in Washington, D.C. in honor of his life, but his life is not a monument. His life is a movement. And so we have to keep that movement going in this generation and in generations yet unborn. We've got to make sure that we speak to the young people who are here tonight and those who are in our communities and help them know that they can be anything they want to be. We have to help them aim high and set high goals and do even greater things in their lives than we have been able to do. We have to know that success without a successor is failure. Each of us has a responsibility to be a role model and a mentor in our homes, in our churches, in our schools, in our communities. We must rise up and take a stand. It's not enough to talk about what somebody else is not doing. It's not enough for us to sit and wait for somebody else to do what we already know we need to do in our communities. It's that part of living Dr. King's creed in his life, that we can help somebody and we can let our light shine. Because if we don't, we will understand that in this urgent hour, so much that we worked for will be snatched away from us. So we have to be those leaders in our community. We have to champion our causes. And we have to make sure that we elect those who stand for freedom and justice in this generation and make sure we elect them and put them in positions where they can speak for us. It's time for us to move out and know that we need political power, economic power, educational power, and most of all, spiritual power. Indeed, this is the fitting tribute that we can give to honor and celebrate a life well lived. And sometimes we wonder just how long it will be before his dream becomes a reality. And I think Dr. King sends the answer to us down through the immortal echoes of time in saying to us, how long? Not long, because no lie can live forever. How long? Not long, because you still reap what you sow. How long? Not long because the arm of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And while it is true that morality cannot be legislated, behavior can be regulated. The law may not change the heart, but it can restrain the heartless. And we must reaffirm our convictions with clarity and let our light shine. And so the call goes forth tonight for those of us who are willing to stand on the front line and be a part of the solution. We need those who are not afraid of the challenges that we will face every day, not afraid of change and all that it represents, because as a people, we've come too far to turn back now. And we've got to speak to our young people each and every day and let them know that the requirements for this millennium are for them to be excellent, to act excellent, and to think excellent. To know that as Aristotle said, excellence is never an accident. It is always the result of high intention, sincere effort, and intelligent execution. It represents the wise choice of many alternatives. Choice, not chance determines your destiny. 
It is our responsibility to say to our young people that life is a hardball game. And in many places, the bases are still loaded against you. They're loaded with those who would tell our young people that these are the days to be carefully, carefree and adventuresome. Instead of telling them the truth, that these are the days to be qualified, to be competent, to be informed, and to be excellent. This world is not yet colorblind, and we still need to exceed normal expectations and be twice as qualified to get the same job as others. And so we have to close the gap between what we say and what we do, in working with our young girls and helping them grow up to be virtuous young women, and working with the black men in our community who will work with our young boys so that they can grow up to become strong black men and be role models in our community. We have to say to our young people, be careful how you dress and how you present yourself in public because everybody is watching you. We have to help them understand integrity and that your word is your bond. Also, we have to let them know that the sky is not the limit. But if you want it, you can have it if you're willing to work for it. And so among us, we have to be the critical thinkers and the diligent workers in this generation. Dr. King said, nothing in all the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. They may have killed the dreamer, but they will never kill his dream. As long as, long as it lives in the hearts of minds of, and of minds of good people like you and I. And we need men and women who are ready to know that they can make a difference. They can change our communities. We need men and women who are not afraid or ashamed of the sacrifices they must face, the rivers they must cross, the burdens they must bear, the mountains they must conquer, the trouble they must endure, the trials they must survive, and the opposition they must overcome. And so as we help each other and help our communities today, we, say, we ask, ask the question, how do we keep the dream alive? And I'm glad you ask. How do we keep the dream alive? By not allowing ourselves to become comfortable in our situation, or complacent or complicit in what is happening in our communities. How do we keep the dream alive? By telling our stories of success. Too many people sacrifice too much so that we could be here today. How do we keep the dream alive by exerting and using the power that is within each and every one of us to speak up, to speak out, to support candidates that champion our causes and keep them responsive and accountable to us? How do we keep the dream alive? By trusting in the power of Almighty God and understanding that we are not impotent or frustrated people, but we are people of power, wisdom, and strength. How do we keep the dream alive? By not letting Dr. King's message and legacy be reduced to nothing more than a predictable set of sanitized sound bites. How do we keep the dream alive? By understanding that we must be the burr in the saddle and make sure that our message is heard. How do we keep the dream alive? By knowing that we must trust in the God that Dr. King believed in and know that no weapon formed against us will be able to prosper. And knowing that the Lord did not bring us this far to leave us. And so we leave tonight understanding that it's time for us to see this, seize this moment, to walk taller, to dream bigger, to think bigger, to work smarter, to try harder, to love deeper, to lead higher, to succeed with humility, to choose wiser, to live better, and to go from strength to strength. Now is the only place where we can start doing that. 
Now is the perfect opportunity to allow our creative juices to flow. Now is the time for access, alignment, accountability, and action. Now is the unique intersection of time and space that we currently inhabit where we can joyfully communicate with God so we can handle the next moment that is placed before us in this generation. And so now is the time for us to believe and know that God wants us to succeed, to stand in our glory and exercise our spiritual authority over anything and anyone who tries to distract, dis diminish, demote, or degrade us. You have your role and your assignment. You are significant. You are making a difference. You are phenomenal. And you are about to turn the corner and become victorious. We have to understand that because he dreamed, we are here today. And the world is still waiting for our children to become what they want to become. Because we know that the best orator has not yet spoken. The best doctor has not yet operated. The best lawyer has not yet litigated. The best singer has not yet sung a note. The best scientist has not yet entered the laboratory. The best teacher has not yet entered the classroom. The best actor has not yet picked up a script. The best musician has not yet picked up an instrument. Because we know that God always has somebody waiting in the incubator of immortality to do their part in this bruised, fractured, and ailing world. So we know we can't give up now. Failure is not an option. Stopping is not an option. We must remain focused, fearless, and faithful to do what God has called us to do. Lamar forgot to tell you I am a preacher. Nobody told us that this road would be easy. But we've come too far and cried too long, prayed too hard, and sacrificed too much to give up now. So I encourage all of us to stay on the road to success. And the road to success is not straight. There's a curve called failure and a loop called confusion. There's speed bumps called friends and red lights called enemies. Caution lights called family. You'll have flat tires called jobs. But if you have a spare called determination, an engine called perseverance, insurance called faith, and a driver named Jesus, you will make it to that place of success. Keep the faith and keep the dream alive. The charismatic, the dynamic, the incomparable Gwendolyn Boyd. Thank you so much for sharing your gift with us. Um, I don't know about you, but I am leaving inspired recharged and re-energized to keep the dream alive. Thank you, Dr. Boyd, so much. At this time, we will have two presentations to Dr. Boyd, our keynote speaker. Our first presentation will come from the president of the Asheville Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Following her will come the president of the Asheville Lynx. just so pleased and elated that you are here and we thank uh, UNCA for the insight of inviting Adil Sora here to speak with us tonight and if you leave here tonight not inspired then you need to come back again <laughs> but on behalf and we would like I'd like for all of Asheville Alumni chapter to stand mm -hmm. <laughs> on behalf of all 
the sorrows of Asheville Lovely Chapter, we'd like to present this token of our appreciation and thank you so much for being with us here tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. On behalf of the Asheville chapter of the Lynx, we want to thank you for their uh, words of wisdom and you energize us to go out and serve the community. And we would like to present you with this token. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Have you had a wonderful evening tonight? Yeah. Truly, it's been an amazing and inspiring evening from the words of Dr. Boyd to our students here and right here in our own backyard. Um, I am just on cloud 10 right now. I'm just, I, this could not have gone any better. Thank you all so much for coming out this evening. Um, if you know me well enough, you know I do not pride myself in having long programs. The brain retains what the seat can hold, and so we've had, uh, We've had a wonderful jam-packed program, and I um, promise to get you home in time enough for you to get at least eight hours of rest tonight. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, enjoy the rest of your night. Enjoy the rest of your week. And we look forward to seeing you at more UNC Asheville events. Thanks so much.